You can start the Harry, would you like to get us started, sir? Yes, absolutely. Well, let me just say by welcome and thank you for joining the webinar series, Connecting States Financial, Economic, and Digital Inclusion Initiatives. Uh, this afternoon, we will explore the third webinar in our series, Refurbished Laptops with Financial and Economic Inclusion Resources. Now, just real briefly, my name is Terry Lee, and I'm a Community Affairs Specialist for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, aka FDIC, for the Atlanta region. And since we have you know, such a diverse group joining us today, let me briefly mention that FDIC is an independent agency created by Congress to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. Now, as a independent, or I should say industry regulator, we are not equipped to address all the challenges facing low and moderate income communities alone. However, with the assistance from those of you joining us today, our, our panelists here, um, all things are possible. So uh, let's see, we go to slide two, Bob. Now uh, here, uh, these are the remaining webinars that will guide us through the rest of uh, this month and into the, uh, November and into uh, December as we highlight and uncover systemic approaches to assist states digital equity planning leaders connect and collaborate with local, state, and national uh, financial and economic inclusion leaders. So if you, if you joined us from the, from the start of the series or just now picking up the conversation, let me just, let me just say that you know, we started off um, in webinar number one, assembling these diverse agencies and organizations, you know, really simply to say, you know, we see what you're doing, we see the lane that you're in, but it's time to get out of those silos, take a look around, take a look left, take a look right, and just simply recognize that we can work together. And then we followed up with our, our second webinar, not only, you know, not only taking a look at the organizations and all the tremendous resources that they bring to bear, but we just wanted to take a look and say, now these are potential possibilities that you can, that you can work towards when it comes to the financial, economic, and digital inclusion efforts, and of course, other dimensions. So now that, now that we've done both webinars and we're looking at number three, you know, they really did, they really did what they were designed to do, which is bring us together, introduce us, kind of, kind of get the conversation started across silos. And so now I like to say for webinar number three, we really get into some tangible pieces of what we've been talking about. And you're going to hear from our presenters, you know, some of the efforts that they've been um, um, focused on, how they've been going about um, operating in that in that sphere and what you know what it looks like to give us a real sense of you know what 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 are we talking about with these inclusion dimensions um, next slide please bob so here's a so here's a snapshot of the agenda today and uh, after my opening remarks my good friend and co-host dr robert mclaughlin with the national collaborative for digital equity will provide a little bit more background and aim of the webinar series. And also um, Robert is, is his um, legal name, but those that talk to him and have that friendship, we like to call him Bob, just to keep it pleasant. And also who we have joining us today for the conversation, I'll tell you what, we have a, a, another, another great cast of uh, actors here. Mike Logan, Senior Vice President with Blum, Tom Finn, CEO for Avid Products, Sarah Seagrest, Vice President of Community for Oct Octomus, and Dr. Jerry Hanley, Executive Director for Skills Commons. And playing cleanup for us, we have Bill Mills, President for Florida Prosperity Partnerships. Next slide, please. Now, so, oh, I guess we, uh, yeah, I think we're. Ready to get the party oh, started? Uh, yeah, well, I should I should just say that you know, with the with the presenters here um, to kind of frame their conversation for today, you know, we really asked them to to take a look from their vantage point, you know, scalable and and sustainable approaches, and the ecosystem that was created to kind of address the refurbished computers bundled with um, inclusion resources and also other possibilities that we're going to be taking a look at. And so let me just say that, you know, the views expressed 
in the presentation here today are the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And so with that, Bob, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Terry, very, very much. And I want a, a big shout out, Terry, to you and your colleagues at FDIC for doing so much to make this entire webinar series possible. We're very, very excited about this. And this is being done in partnership as many of you saw, no doubt, in the invite uh, messages that went out uh, in partnership with the FCC, NTIA, uh, U.S. Department of Labor, a whole, a whole cast of characters uh, that are really excited about the opportunity that the federal uh, grant program uh, for digital equity under the infrastructure bill, there is uh, five years of support uh, through U.S. Department of Commerce's NTIA, for states to develop and then implement over the next five years, digital equity plans in support of economic opportunity and inclusion. And we're really taking that to heart in, in terms of bringing together not only digital equity uh, leaders uh, at the local, state, and national level, but also leaders in financial inclusion, economic, educational, and other dimensions of inclusion, because we regard this uh, a grant program as a heaven sent maybe once in a generation opportunity for us all together to collaborate in each state, to bring together inclusion leaders, to really make, a, make an impact on intergenerational poverty. That's really the, that's the, that's the, 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 the diabolical plan here is to really bring inclusion leaders together so that state digital equity planning leaders know about others who are involved in different complementary aspects of inclusion so that state plans, which can under the federal infrastructure bill, be uh, addressing systemic inclusion, not just digital equity. We wanna help do all we can together to make that a reality in every state. So that's, that's the plan here with the webinar series this fall. Uh, and uh, as, as you mentioned in previous webinars, Terry, uh, we're going to be culminating uh, this whole uh, series of conversations next spring, uh, we hope in Atlanta, uh, uh, on March 15, 16, and we say we hope because the facility we've been hoping uh, to hope house, uh, house the uh, National Summit for State Systemic Inclusion Planning Teams is, we, we just learned, might still be under renovation, but we're committed on March 15, 16, uh, in, in next year to bring together national state planning teams to continue this conversation and to share promising practices with each other so that our respective state uh, plans for systemic inclusion are as impactful and as rich as possible. The last piece of the puzzle uh, you'll see in this bottom bullet here on, on this slide, Inclusion Junction. This is a tool set that was kindly developed by Nishal Chandra who is, uh, is, is not only the leader for software development for Oracle Health, uh, but very kindly philanthropically donated his own time to create Inclusion Junction as a simple tool set by which inclusion leaders can find out about each other and share their own contact information. So this is all part of a capacity building as a national collaborative infrastructure to bring inclusion leaders together. Now, with that said, very briefly, what we're looking at as a quick overview, why we all together felt that this topic would be really uh, fruitful for a national webinar around refurbished laptops. What we're really thinking about is several key points here. And by the way, we will send out the slideshow uh, as well as this uh, webinar recording to everybody afterwards who is registered and will make the links to the slide deck and to the webinar recording available on our websites also. Uh, so please don't worry that these details may be whizzing by. You're gonna find these slides are richer than we have time to do justice to. That's actually by design. We want the slides to be rich and a resource for you afterwards. Uh, and we also wanna allow for as much time for Q&A at, at the end of today's uh, webinar. That said, broad brush strokes, what we regard as uh, really strategically important with refurbished laptops in the whole national digital inclusion for economic opportunity context 
is refurbishment is not only an, an environmentally sound thing to do, it's a very cost effective way as we're going to explore with our fellow panelists here in a moment. It's a very cost effective and environmentally responsible way to leverage uh, recent used computers uh, that are robust enough to do everything you can possibly demand from them. These are recent, uh, the, the, the partnership we're gonna be sharing about today. There are other wonderful refurbished laptop initiatives like PCs for People, uh, other local and national refurbishment networks are doing some, some wonderful work in this space. This particular flavor you're gonna hear about today takes advantage of drive imaging. When you wipe a device clean, you wipe the drive clean and, and or put on a new drive is you can point to other inclusion resources on that drive image. So we'll be exploring that today. And we think that's a very significant uh, point of, uh, in this whole webinar. Another point is that if you're not already aware of multiple sources of funding for these and other refurbished devices, there's not only the Affordable Connectivity Program, which can provide a subsidy, a one-time subsidy of up to $100 per device, but also federal apprenticeship funding, workforce investment. TANF recipients can get subsidies in some states to finance devices. Pell grants for those on financial aid can cover these the cost of, of new and refurbished devices. There are a variety of funding sources that we're going to be sharing information about after the webinar as well about how to fund. With that said, I, we're going to we're going to move right to my my esteemed colleague Mike Logan with Bloom. And Mike, if you would kindly do the honor, sir. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. So, as Bob mentioned, my name is Mike Logan, and I'm with Bloom Technology. Um, and Bob, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll spend just a second on that one. Uh, this slide was really included for those who aren't going to watch the presentation live and they only get the information um, through the slide deck. Uh, so this is, if you don't know who Bloom Technology is, just a very, very quick snapshot. We're one of the largest technology companies in the country, uh, specializing in just about everything a company would need, from a mom and pop to a Fortune 500, meeting rooms, computing solutions, networking, digital signage, uh, really everything that you can imagine. Um, around the, the umbrella of technology. Uh, Bloom, Bloom focuses on providing those services. But today, we're focused on a very, very specific side of what we do. And that's the ITAT or the buyback, the recycling and refurbishing of devices. And so I just wanna walk you through the process and, and help you understand exactly what it is that the recipients of the programs, um, the low-income families are gonna be receiving uh, as part of the, this fight against the, the digital equity. So, you know, we're just going to take a sample device. Let's say there's a Windows device, eighth gen processor. And to put that in perspective, that's about a three to four year old machine, which is about when they're removed from service out of corporate America. So the device needs to be refreshed. That decision has been made. And so what happens next? There's really two paths that it can take. The first one um, is, unfortunately, it can end up in a landfill. And this happens more often than you might think. Uh, landfills are absolutely loading up with electronics. Only 2% of landfills are made up of electronics, but they still equate for 70% of our toxic waste. So the more we can keep these devices out of landfills, we can keep the heavy metals out of the environment, we're going to be doing ourselves a huge uh, service. And I know this is about digital equity, but I think that the importance of recycling devices needs to be brought up in the environmental impact that it has. So maybe that's a Bob, maybe that's just a little bonus for people to, um, to, to enjoy as we move into this. Now, what's the alternative away from a laptop, away from a landfill? So the device could be given to Bloom Technology, and then we're going to evaluate the condition of the device. If, if the device is, is um, beat up, if it's busted up, if it's just beyond repair, uh, and it's not something that can be reserviceable, uh, then we're going to go ahead and harvest the parts. We're going to remove all the metals. We're going to recycle it correctly. By recycling the plastic, we're not going to go into single stream recycling, but we're actually going to break it out and recycle it correctly um, and keep all that toxic waste out of the landfill. So that's one thing that we're going to do. We're also going to be harvesting the parts, and that's important because, again, some of the parts on those machines might still be usable. Then the other side of it is where if the, if the device is in pretty good shape, we're going to look at the device and we're going to say this is a, research, or this is a device that can be recertified. The recertified process is not to just wipe it down with a Clorox wipe and put it in a box and ship it back out. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's not a lot of standardization around recertified devices. So 
when you go shopping online, if you were to look online at recertified devices, there's a huge disparity between the process people go through. Bloom Technology is one of the, the, the larger recertification companies in the country. Um, we have three, actually in North America, we have three facilities. Uh, we have the Dallas, uh, Minnesota, and the Toronto facilities all doing recertification. And when we look at the, uh, the, the recertification process, we do a complete data, the, uh, data destruction, and that's documented. It should be documented for anything that's coming out of a state, local government, a school system. Um, most corporations that we work with ask for a, uh, you know, some sort of documentation of data destruction. Then I always like to say the device is scrubbed clean because people say, what do you mean by scrub clean? Do you mean digitally or physically? And, and the answer is yes. So we, we do scrub it clean. We, uh, we do disinfect the device physically, but then we completely scrub it of any user information uh, that, that could still be left over or residual information that's in the device. If there's cosmetic damage, we, uh, we can fix it. We basically touch it up with touch up paint, just as you might expect. Um, if there's a cracked panel, then we'll go ahead and, and fix that, uh, replace it as needed. We'll always replace the hard drive. Um, there's really two consumable pieces in a laptop. It's the hard drive and the battery. So both of those consumable pieces are replaced. So they're getting a brand new hard drive. They're getting a brand new battery. Screen hinges have a tendency to get a little bit loose. And if you ever, uh, you know, I always like to tell people, just think about the last time you opened up a brand new laptop and you opened it up and it was a little bit stiff, right? It was a little bit hard to open. And you just knew at that moment you had a brand new laptop. And so we want the people that are receiving these to have that same feeling. So we do go ahead and tighten up all the, the little hinges. We uh, tighten up the fans. If anything's loose inside, we'll, we'll basically give it a good tune up. Um, then the device is fully tested for quality control. So we're going to run it through all the quality control tests, make sure every aspect, every component of that device is working. Then we'll install Windows, install Office, and then install some other programs that Bob's graciously put together that are going to be really beneficial for people who are receiving these machines. And then the device is reintroduced into the market for additional service. Now, the important thing about this is I went ahead, uh, Bob, you know, based on our conversation earlier in the week, I decided to check and see what, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of machines are, they, uh, are being you know, repurposed. So the ones that were just recently sent out were $1,100 machines four years ago. So four years ago, companies were buying these, giving them to salespeople. Today, um, as an executive in a, in a fairly large organization, I can tell you, I could take one of those machines and easily get through a week of work um, and, and certainly longer. They're, they're machines that you would expect to be fully serviceable in corporate America, and that's what they are. So these are not the, you know, with the, perhaps uh, the, the danger of sounding uh, crass, um, they're not the cheap Black Friday machines that you see for $200 at, uh, at, at Walmart. Um, these are very, very good. They're corporate grade, executive grade machines that are being recertified and being given to the low income families. So that's really uh, Bloom's part in this. And, uh, and then what we end up doing is we bundle them with a set of headphones. And I'm going to uh, get the, the pleasure of introducing uh, my good friend, Mr. Tom Finn from Avid Products. He's the CEO. I've known him for a few years. And I think that the opener, Tom, that I'm going to give you um, is you know, we, we have to make lemonade out of lemons. And, uh, and earlier in this call, we struggled to get our videos working, you know, so the cameras just wouldn't quite come on the way we wanted them to. So Bob said, ah, you know what, we'll just go with audio, it'll be fine. And he's 100% right. If we go with audio, it is fine. But without audio, this call was a bust. Um, we would have canceled, we would have had to reschedule, there's no chance we could have actually had the call. So when you're watching any type of a presentation, and you're listening to the presentation, consider the value of the video versus the audio. And that's really what Tom Finn and his company provides is a really high quality audio experience uh, for these uh, for the recipients in the program. So, Tom, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Mike. Thank you. You know, my mom always said I had a perfect face for radio. I guess today is proof of that. Well, it's an honor to be here with all of you today, particularly Bob and Terry, Mike, Sarah, Jerry and Bill, you know, uh, I'm Tom Finn, CEO and employee co-owner of Avid Products based in Middletown, Rhode Island. And we are a 25, 26 person employee owned company that provide audio solutions for learners of all kinds, wherever they might be on their learning journey. But before getting into Avid and the headsets, which I think are particularly important, you know, when we were with the group the other afternoon uh, preparing for this conversation, what, what struck us collectively and what I'd ask all of you participants to think about is this is more than computers and headsets, a, a bundle. Well, what's a bundle? It's the inclusion uh, resources. You'll hear from uh, Sarah and uh, Jerry and Bill subsequently. This is really a platform for access and inclusion and connectedness which is so fundamentally 
important to all folks and lacking for so many, unfortunately. I think something like 5 million U.S. households with children lack consistent access to connected devices. Uh, one in five kids ages 3 to 18 live in those houses that don't have access. So really, this is about access, inclusion, and connectedness. The program we're sharing with you today sure includes some hardware devices, but those inclusion resources are really the thing that that, that make it you know the complete deal. It's a scalable, tangible, and impactful program. Uh, as Mike referenced and Bob did as well, it's a sustainable and responsible model from an eco-friendly. You know, think more broadly than just providing the access, but really making contributions to the communities that are so critically important and vital to all of us. And it's enabled by purpose-driven, committed, and capable thought leaders like my colleagues here with us and all of you who invested the time today to listen. So why headsets? Well, headsets and the computers are really vehicles to provide that access and connectedness. Headsets in particular, we learned this, we, we've thought about it for a long time, but COVID really demonstrated. At, at their core, they deliver sound through speakers and capture sound through microphones. But the headset also eliminates ambient distractions, which then lead to greater attention, focus, engagement, and efficacy. Enable the participant to hear well and clearly, but also to be heard. And there's a double entendre there right, to be heard through the microphone, but also to have voice. And, you know, related to that is a sense of self and agency, not being in a distracted household or classroom with all sorts of stuff going on, but that's the person in that moment. It, it, hearing and sound are particularly important when we think about uh, social emotional learning or language literacy or uh, English as a second language. Um, and then there's something really magical that happens through sound and a little graphic you see here. It's just a, a reminder to me and I hopefully are sharing with all of you that when sound hits the brain, some amazing things happen. And you know we can see on a computer screen, but what happens when we actually hear something, the brain reacts to it. You know, whether it's a emotional processing, high level valuation of ab abstract stimulus, uh, high level sequencing templates of stuff we've seen before or heard before that get re uh, remembered in the moment, reward-related predictive stuff. So, you know, I'd, I'd invite you all to visit us. We've got some links down at the bottom of the chart to hear more about not just the company, but the power of audio, the power of connectedness through sound. So thank you for the opportunity, Bob and Terry and colleagues. A uh, pleasure to be part of this. Really an honor to be contributing our small part to it. And I, I, I'll do what Mike did for me. <laughs> My honor to introduce Sarah that got me into this. So Sarah is an amazing connector of interesting people and sometimes people like me that have the pleasure <laughs> of connecting with interesting people. Sarah, thank you for this and for all that you do for all of us. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, and, and great to hear from everybody here. Um, it was interesting uh, when we did a prep call and, and it felt felt like a little bit of a a, a, a strange family reunion of sorts. I've, I've known and worked with Bob uh, for many years and, and um, I've gotten to know Terry and the others through that. So um, Sarah Seagrest um, here with Octosmos, which is my consultancy, but I'm a specialist in emerging technology uh, specifically for um, education. Um, and I want to talk about Rebella today. Uh, Rebella is a virtual world platform um, that I've also been working with for the last two and a half years. I'm sure you've heard of the metaverse uh, in the news and don't let that scare you, <laughs> but but this is uh, an element of what is being talked about. However, what's not being talked about in, in the uh, media as much is how these uh, virtual worlds and this technology uh, can, can really do some amazing good things and, and has been doing it for a while. Rebella has been around for 10 years um, and has been working with uh, global uh, companies um, for that time. And one of the most interesting things about uh, Verbella uh, and access to the Verbella Open Campus, which is a, a virtual world, will be uh, provided on these laptops for uh, LMI students and families to be able to access uh, for building community. Um, and that is one amazing thing about these worlds is their ability to facilitate a feeling of presence and community. Uh, so even though you're being represented by an avatar and it looks very game-like and it is built on a gaming engine called Unity, but we're bringing that game 
gaming technology to a professional purpose. And so there are hundreds, uh, sometimes thousands of people that work together every day in, in Verbella worlds. And I welcome any of you to come visit Verbella Open Campus uh, anytime. It's a free uh, world that you can access. Um, and it really has a unique power in bringing a quality of voice and representation. So by having choice over how you represent yourself in the world, uh, having choice in how you can communicate with others from audio, uh, like Tom was talking about the importance of audio um, and spatial audio. So you have that sense of realism and you feel embodied in that avatar because you have uh, um, that, that control and it, and it feels like you're really present with others there. But you can also communicate with nonverbal gestures like a wave uh, or a clap, and you can also uh, use text-based communication. So all of that choice of communication tends to bring those who might not typically have a voice or feel like they have a voice um, uh, up, up to a level where, where they feel confident in being able to talk or communicate with others. And the specific uh, application that we will be using Verbella for with this program um, is to help support uh, financial literacy education and, and mentorship um, and, and bringing people together. So I want to point out on this slide before we move to the next one, uh, the different purposes that Verbella is being used for today, everything from uh, recruiting for employment, uh, onboarding, learning and development, um, user engagement and, and building a persistent online community, uh, meetings and, and mentoring, and events and job fairs. And that is being done by the likes of uh, PwC, Stanford Business has ongoing classes in a Verbella world. So does MIT, Arizona State University has used Verbella, the World Bank, um, you can see Johnson & Johnson, Deloitte, uh, they're doing this today. And so we can provide a lot of evidence data around the efficacy of communicating and connecting in a virtual world, which is something you can't get in Zoom. Uh, and in, in some ways you can't get in person uh, for some of the reasons mentioned. So next slide, please, Bob. Uh, there is studies out there, this one is from PwC, but there are many others that it, four times faster to, to train um, individuals than in an uh, in-person classroom or in e-learning. And a lot of that is about that choice of representation, uh, the equality of voice. Rebella was designed by an organizational psychologist. And so it comes at it from that perspective, not a tech perspective. The technology is meant to support the human beings uh, and it comes at it from that angle and that design which makes it very different uh, from a lot of the other technology that you'll see out there today. Uh, the confidence to apply the learned skills uh, that, that are learned in uh, worlds like Verbella um, uh, can be astronomically <laughs> more. Um, and, and it really does help to support the underserved in particular. I'm working with a group called IT Can, uh, represents persons with disabilities, um, whether it's a visual impairment or physical impairment or hearing impairment, um, to get into technology fields. And the benefits for them for a virtual world are, are, are immense. Uh, it really levels the playing field. Uh, so last slide, please, as I keep an eye on my time. Um, one more slide for me there, Bob. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, uh, and there's so much more to go into, I would be happy to have a conversation with anyone interested <laughs> about all of the nuances behind this, but an enterprise grade security is a big differentiator for Verbella, as is the ability to support hundreds of thousands of people in a world all at once. Um, but but because uh, of the path Rebella has taken, um, we can pass uh, the security requirements of these global organizations and governmental organizations, um, which no one else really can. So this is sort of uh, behind the curtain, but we're SOC 2 compliance, um, InfoSec. Uh, we don't store anything uh, other than an, an email uh, and a name. Uh, and that, that is a big differentiator as well. We're not marketing to our users. Uh, we have data security, SSO, and, and are enterprise ready for these large organizations. So uh, that's a big difference as well. And um, with that, I, I would love to 
uh, kind of tee up um, Dr. Jerry Hanley with Skills Commons, whose um, amazing learning materials uh, we'll, we'll have in this Verbella world, in this classroom, to help uh, facilitate uh, the connections with the cohort we're talking about here. And, so. and Sarah, if I could, uh, Jerry, if I could just steal a second just to, uh, to help folks, uh, I, I should have uh, explained more fully, I think, just very briefly at the start, that when we're describing these resources and we talk about, about them as being bundled, as you know, Sarah, with the refurbished laptops, what we're doing is taking advantage of wiping drives clean, putting on a new, uh, you know, putting in a new drive, installing Windows 11 on it. That allows us to also put Office, the full boat of Office on there, uh, point to the Rebel of uh, Open Campus, the free campus, and other resources. Uh, and, and so, for example, we're, we also point to 211, which is a national agreement between the United Way and the FCC that gives uh, United Way the ability to staff in every state. If you call 211, you get pointed to a help desk that's staffed 24-7, 365 by folks who sit in front of a database of human service providers across that state that can provide free supports for low and moderate income folks. This is one of the, this, this and bundling with the financial literacy resources that Sarah, you mentioned, Verbella. And now as we pivot to, uh, to Jerry's exciting work with Skills Commons, what we're doing is taking advantage, rethinking what refurbished laptops can make possible by, tr by tr uh, transforming a refurbished device also into a into an inclusion resource delivery mechanism. So Jerry, mm -hmm. with that, would you please take it away, sir? <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Bob. And, and again, I'll just say it's a truly an honor to be here with Terry, Bob, you, um, Mike, Tom, uh, Sarah, and Bill. And I think the theme is all around empowerment. When you look about what Mike is providing a mechanism with that refurbished laptop, to bring the world to the fingertips of your LMI student and family. Um, you know, uh, and when Tom is giving voice to that the empowerment process of the learning process and what Sarah has described as an amazing environment that can really enable people to engage in many new ways that they don't can't do in their physical environment. And what we have to help to contribute to this is a set of learning resources to help people find career pathways for a sustainable family income. So, so next next slide. So um, over the uh, after over the last many years, I've done a number of uh, projects with uh, U.S. Department of Labor, and one of the U.S. Department of Labor projects is called Career One Stop. And when you're looking at how do you enable people to explore the possible careers and what the income might be? And is it, is it a growth opportunity? And, and what's required for me to get into this profession? And where can I get training? Well, the Department of Labor has supported this website, Career One Stop, that provides some amazing resources. And I'm going to highlight some of these next. So, Bob, next slide. So, if you go to careeronestop.org, Here's what the website looks like. And you can see I can find training, explore careers, search for jobs, get some help in my local communities. And next slide. And one of the things that, that you can find is really explore careers. And here's an example of if I want to look into plumbing and I can say, is this job likely to improve over time? And the U.S. Department of Labor uses data to say, yep, this looks like it's got an average growth. And what would be the median income? It's like $60,000 a year. So I might say, boy, this can be a really sustainable income for myself and my family. And what's the type of education might I need in this area? So Career One Stop allows you to virtually explore all this information based on excellent data from the US Department of Labor. So imagine going through you know, Sarah's uh, virtual environment going to your local virtual library and say, what would it be like to be a plumber? Or next slide, what if I wanted to go into construction? And this one, it says, boy, the future looks very bright. And the average salary, 30, medium salary, 38,000. And you know what? I got a high school degree. 
I can make it too, right? So in the next slide, or they might say, I may want to go into uh, healthcare areas and there's surgical technologists, all right? And again, this is another one that's average growth. You have salaries of 48,000. And here, I, you know what? I'm going to need an associate's degree. So I'm going to have to look at career and technical education community colleges that, that I may want to pursue there. And finally, one more here. And since the banking industry and the banks and the, the Community Reinvestment Act is such a powerful um, initiative to enable things, looking at people getting into the banking industry. And here's a case where you say, boy, the outlook looks bright. Um, the, the income is looking at medium income of $77,000. But here, I'm going to have to pursue a bachelor's degree. And one of the things that's important about Career One Stop, and this is a little bit set up for Bill, the, the next person from Florida, is you can say, where am I? And what are the projected employment that I have in my state? So we have in Florida, there's a 23% change in increase in the demand for accountants and auditors. So with that, uh, imagine going in and allowing people to explore all types of careers and have them make choices so they are empowered with the resources that you're providing, with the network that, that you're providing providing the financial literacy skills that they can acquire to have that sustainable family income. Next slide. Now, one of the other things, um, so you have career one stop. Now, the US Department of Labor also invested $1.9 billion over an eight year period for every state in the nation to look at how can they really reinvent and innovate in workforce training materials. And one of the key requirements of, that, of those materials developed by 256 different projects across the nation in the areas of healthcare, manufacturing, IT, energy, facilities, agriculture, culture, all these areas, was they were free and openly licensed mean that you can download and customize these resources for your own local training program. And so these are all available in the library. So you can think, all right, so we'll, we can have a little skills commons library over in um, the, uh, your virtual world that you can create and then um, and explore these training resources. And if you go to the um, next slide. And so th th this is the, um, the simple uh, website. You, you got a, a search bar there. You pop in in, in your topic that, that you want, and then it, it'll, it'll generate um, those resources. And, and so again, in Verbella, going to this virtually with your uh, refurbished laptop, listening to stories and you engaging with people, all can be brought together um, for your uh, own for free, no charge, just got that internet connection. Next slide. Now, one of the important elements in enabling people to really become immersed in understanding um, the skills and knowledge that they need to be successful in the job is our apprenticeship programs. And again, this is another big priority for the U.S. Department of Labor. And it also can be a way that people can explore those careers in the real world once they have the skills and knowledge. And, and so apprenticeship programs become so important, then how do you design really effective apprenticeship programs? And Skills Commons working with all these programs across the nation, have organized materials about, think about toolkits for how to design successful apprenticeship programs. And so next slide. And um, so in this slide, uh, originally there's some animation in here um, and you can play with it when you can download it. It says, here's how you use uh, and what you need to do with an apprenticeship programs. And if I want to find one in healthcare or IT or manufacturing or finance, we have specific programs around those that give you more detail. And we can even provide you the instructional materials for, for the different programs. All these freely available um, within Skills Commons and skillscommons.org. 
Now, the next slide is around um, the, the critical role that bank employees, particularly with um, the uh, Community Reinvestment Act, reaching out to bring their expertise in financial literacy and become excellent educators. And um, again, this slide had a little animation behind that says, you know, just because you have the content expertise doesn't always make you an excellent instructor. And so what we've done in Skills Commons is actually created little tutorials online that could be self-directed, self-paced, or we can work with you to create customized ones that help you understand how to really take the technical expertise that you might have in banking, in financial literacy, um, in um, uh, pursuing educational pathways that you have that expertise and how do you effectively teach it? And it could be in a classroom or could, could be on a job site. There are different methodologies. And so we give you these little pointers to help you jumpstart your effective instruction. And that's gonna be an important element of, of our strategy here to support your local community who have the passion and the expertise to support the local community that you're serving. And with that, just an outstanding example of how in Florida, they are doing just that. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Bill Mills. Thanks so much, Jerry. So yeah, Bill Mills with FPP Coalition. Uh, so FPP is a uh, nonprofit coalition of financial capability practitioners. So we got a lot of folks that are doing financial education, financial social work, counseling, coaching, that type of thing. And uh, our mission really is to elevate financial capability for all. And, and I want you to remember that specific term, financial capability. But before I get deep into that, I, I just want you to look at a couple of um, things that we have on our website um, just to tell who we are uh, and, and the type of work we do. There's the roles there. But on the right is the platforms for prosperity. And basically what we do is we try to partner with any organization really that has that platform for helping people to be, become more financially capable. And you'll see there that, you know, it's where they live, learn, work, bank, start businesses, get healthy, receive social services, worship, are entertained, whatever it might be. You can always think that there are, are a couple of things that are uh, common in all of these platforms. One, of course, is money. Um, you're, uh, there's always money involved in pretty much everything in life, right? But another one is technology, and it's not something that we always think about. I know that uh, when my uh, kids were looking at uh, where they're what they're going to do for college and, and not knowing uh, exactly what they were going to do, I'm sorry, looking for uh, where, where they were going to go for high school and not thinking of what, what they were going to do. And uh, we have a couple of different programs here in Central Florida, where I live, where they were looking at um, there's technology um based uh, magnet schools. There's um, also some uh, magnet schools for finance and such. And, and my thought was, uh, you know, you can't go wrong with either one because they touch every part of our lives. And so when we look at um, what is financial capability, Bob, can you go ahead and advance to the next slide for me? We um, have a particular financial capability the continuum that we look at um, that our partners uh, help people to move from financial crisis to stability, onto security, hopefully onto well-being and prosperity. And you can see that those arrows go both ways because, well, yes, uh, you can go both ways in, uh, on that continuum. But specifically, I keep mentioning the term financial capability. And the reason I, I mention that term specifically is because, yes, financial education is great, but you also have to be willing to put that knowledge into practice. And then you also have to have that uh, means to do so, hence financial capability. It's not just the knowledge, but it's also that willingness and the knowledge. So, uh, sorry, the willingness and the means. With this project that we're working on, yes, we're giving them all the resources here for the knowledge, where it's kind of on them uh, for that willingness, 
but we're also giving them the means to do so. And that's why this really is financial capability. It's putting the in, in the hands of individuals, that opportunity to advance themselves through all those different platforms that I just spoke about. It's, it's uh, helping them to advance themselves in education. It's helping them to advance themselves in work, whatever it might be, by going with this type of a, uh, uh, a refurb, the refur refurbished laptops. But we're also giving them that extra step as well to help them make sure that um, they can do that. And that's by, go ahead and go to the next uh, slide for me, Bob. That's by giving them all the different tools um, on this refurbished technology. And of course, I can't go without go, doing a little bit of a plug for Spondulix, which we plan on putting on this um, these platforms. Spondulix is uh, FPP's financial edutainment broadcast platform. It's the one, only one of its kind. Uh, we uh, currently broadcast 24-7 financial education done in an entertaining way. And so this will be available on all of these laptops um, coming uh, forward. Thanks, Bob, for putting that up there, spondulix.org. And um, uh, coming soon this next year, we're actually going to have uh, audio podcasts on there and uh, we're gonna have some blogs as well for people to, to look at. But uh, we already have 30 content providers um, providing edutainment, like I said, 24 seven. So can't go without promoting that. So just remember financial capability, it's not just the knowledge, it is also that willingness and the means to do so. Bob, I'll send it back to you. This, this is fabulous, Bill. Thank you so much. Let me just add a couple of things before we pivot and open up for Q&A. There's some really good questions and comments in the, in the chat I wanted to share with everybody uh, and get the panelists to kindly respond to. But one of the things that, that uh, Bill, you were very understated about and very modest about, Bill, in, in leading the Florida Prosperity Partnership, is a rock star in the national community called Bank On. Bank on is a national initiative that we point to with these refurbished laptops as well. There are 16 statewide bank on coalitions, and there are about 90 local ones as well. And in Florida, Bill leads the Florida, the Bank on Florida, as well as seven. I, I, I'm losing count. I think it may be up to eight or close to eight uh, local, yes, right? Local coalitions. And one of the things we gratefully do with the drive image, thanks to all our partners on this call, is we have the drive image pointing to the national map where folks can who get these free computers that are financed through other funding sources. We'll get into that in the Q&A in a moment. Uh, but it points to uh, the bank on coalitions that are in their state or in their community or as close to them as possible. What bank on offers are free checking accounts or very low cost with no bounce check fees. And many of them also offer financial literacy education for free. Uh, and what we're doing, thanks to Sarah and her friends that, that she's worked with for, for years at Verbella with our, with our free use of that wonderful virtual campus, working with Jerry Handley's uh, from, industry, from industry expert to expert instructor course in Skills Commons in Verbella. We're in the process this fall of working with interested banks who uh, line up volunteers to go provide free financial literacy coaching, which is one of the most common things that the nation's banks and credit unions routinely do. What we wanna do is help them with their pedagogy. In other words, what do you do if you are an expert, you're a bank branch manager, and you go into a room full of, of velociraptors, AKA carnivores, AKA high school kids, or uh, college students, and you need to learn about some pedagogy so you know how to be very engaging with the content that you're brilliant at. What we're doing with Bank On is piloting this fall, leveraging the nation's hundreds of thousands of hours of free financial literacy coaching that banks and credit unions do and upping the game on pedagogy through all this and making, we're pointing through these refurbished devices to those resources, but knowing also you don't need our flavor of refurbished laptop to do that. 
but this is just a way to, to help folks find out about these resources. And Bill, you, what you all do with, with Bank on It in Florida is really exemplary. That said, oh good, Jerry, you put a link to that course from industry expert to excellent instructors in the chat. So there's that. But let's let's go back if we could, before we get to inclusion junction, make sure we take time for folks' questions. So uh, Shelby uh, Hinkle uh, posts a question. And this, I think, Mike, you could really help with this a lot. Uh, could you send devices? Can one donate devices to be refurbished from across the US to Bloom? Or do you have to be in one of those three states or communities where you have your processing plants? Mike, could you share about that? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is anywhere. You can be anywhere in North America to donate devices. And uh, we can arrange the shipping of the devices. And we can work with you on how to package them up and everything else. So. Um, we, ha we have uh, multiple locations that do the refurbishing, but it's important. We have uh, four large headquarter offices, but we have a presence in all 50 states and Canada. So really anywhere in North America, if we're, we're happy to help you. And I put my email on the slide. Um, I can type it again here in the chat. Just reach out to me. And then based on your location, I'll put you in touch with the right people that can help you, you know, take that donation. And, and if I could build on that, Mike, really quickly uh, on, on that question, that excellent question, Shelby. One of the one of the the aspirations we have as in partnership with the FDIC, FCC, uh, and NTIA of Commerce and other partners in this whole webinar and summit series is we're hoping to equip every state digital equity planning leader with this kind of information about how you can uh, how they can help promote uh, not only our but other. Uh, refurbished laptop programs. Uh, we're really, again, wanting to wanting to leverage the federal, the $1.25 billion for the nation's states over the next five years for digital equity planning, development, and implementation to really make this information much more easily available and to bake this into every state plan. So we're going to be taking your questions and condensing them We've been invited by uh, Angela Thee Bennett, the program officer with NTIA, who oversees digital equity, to put together a guide with our partners for the, the nation state digital equity planners. Your questions are going to be excellent ones that we're going to be trying to address as best we know how in this guide for state digital equity planners. So we, we, we definitely want to uh, make sure we follow up on these questions. Then Lisa in the chat. Um, and this, it, again, is a, 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 question, a good question, Mike, for you, and I think for others as well. And I'd like to share a quick thought about this too. Uh, Lisa asks, what is the best way to get a refurbished computer for someone? And, and, and again, how can we donate computers, which you just touched on? Uh, and, and Lisa also kindly comments that this is wonderful that these refurbished devices are reused instead of going into landfills. Amen. That's definitely part of our plan. One of the things I will share is that this right now, we're hoping, but we're not there yet. We are hoping to equip the 211 help desk in every state in the union, which is staffed by and financed by United Way. We're hoping to provide them with information so that when somebody calls up or, or goes on online, www.211.org, and says, I need, a, I need a refurbished laptop, I'm low income, uh, and there's a, a simple vetting process for them. We're hoping to get, we're not quite there yet. What we're hoping to do, and you'll see a slide earlier in the slideshow when we send it all out to you, there is a, an aspirational vision that we have for creating a statewide ecosystem, a sustainable ecosystem to get folks not only to donate used devices for refurbishment, but also get funders, state and federal agencies for low and moderate income individuals of all ages, uh, U.S. Department of Labor apprenticeship dollars, Pell Grant funding, uh, CRA from banks. There are a variety of funding sources, and we need to mobilize because we're all not there yet. And as I, I'm sure most people on this call already know, the affordable connectivity program is helpful. It does a one-time subsidy of $100 per device, but 
that doesn't go far enough. And Mike, would you like to add something to that, sir? Well, actually, I was going to address the other question that came up is, um, so two things, if you want to obtain a device, you can certainly reach out to me um, and, and I'll put you in touch with the right person. But the other thing was really a great question is around, you know, the fact that they still need digital literacy skills and affordable community-based computer maintenance and repair. And, and Bob, I have, to, I have to just give you a big shout out here because um, in the early stages of this program, Bob was insistent that we offer um, at least a 12 month and we came to an 18 month warranty repair um, for, so it's a full maintenance repair, um, everything that you need on that laptop. So um, these aren't just being shipped out with a 30 day warranty. Um, that's a really good point, uh, David. And uh, you know, appreciate you bringing up and it's a, it's a good point that these do have 18 month warranties on them. Thank you, Mike. And, and let me add too, this brings to mind another comment in the chat, a question about uh, how, do, how can we point users to tech support well, this is where the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and their brilliant work on growing a national network with many, many hundreds of partners. I'm sure many who are on this call right now, there is, there's an initiative known as Digital Navigator, which is a capacity building effort to train folks to provide that kind of support and pointing to uh, tech support and, and how do you get a free laptop, that sort of thing. There are many, many state and local programs that provide free uh, tech support training. Tech Goes Home in Boston is really quite famous for this. They're, they're, one of the things we want to do, we're not there yet uh, to be transparent about it, but we certainly aspire to uh, being able to provide information with help from, from colleagues. We want to, to equip the nation's two-in-one -one help desks that, again, are staffed 24-7, 365, and have on-call translators and TDD and TDY for those with visual and hearing impairments. So 211 is an extraordinary infrastructure. We want to provide the 211 help desk with information on digital navigators, as well as when we can get the funding streams to provide a supply in advance free of refurbished laptops as well. So these are pieces of the puzzle, and we just want to be honest about we're not, it's all not yet in place, but we, we believe that the, the federal digital equity uh, planning program can help us do that together. Uh, let's scroll down here uh, to the next comment. Uh, let's see here. Um, so David says, um, yes, uh, as, as you alluded to, Mike, David Rosen commented about how, how important it is that uh, we help make sure that those who receive these refurbished devices and any uh, free device with the digital literacy skill that they need and, and local sources of support for maintenance and repair, amen, on that. Uh, and yes, they should be. And, and David, your question raises a good question for all of us, I think, on this call together, panelists and participants alike. We need to assist and expect our state digital equity planning leaders to address your questions, David, to make sure that every state plan does have provisions, uh, because you're looking at $1 billion over the next four years to implement state plans, there's, a, there's certainly room for capacity to make sure that every state does indeed make digital literacy skill development and, and community-based uh, maintenance and repair part of that strategy. Um, now, let's see. Uh, let's see, Shelby, you say, um, uh, are these available to be purchased? Uh, and uh, Mike, would you like to comment about that? Sure, they, they are available to be purchased. Now, to be clear, the, the, you know, we've worked with some really good partners on our end. People like Microsoft have really stepped up. So if you're looking at purchasing this for a low-income family, a low-income individual, we can offer them at that same price to, um, you know, to everybody. If they are for individuals, though, um, then they're not eligible for those programs. So just to be super clear, they have to be going into a program that supports low-income uh, individuals. And and to and related to that, Mike, there's a question from Denise uh, Camarillo Cruz, uh, which says to add to Shelby's question, there are many people in my community who also need refurbished devices. Can we buy them directly on the site? Yes, you can. Just contact me. We can put you in touch with the right people. Um, we don't have a website set up because there are some stipulations, but based on what you're saying, I'm sure it's going to be uh, it's going to qualify for the program. So we can put you in touch with the right person that can uh, just take the information and go ahead and get you 
you know, everything that you need in order to place the order. And there was another comment about there are other resources for recert recertified devices. And, you know, I won't I won't certainly hide behind that, that uh, that we're the only company out there. But I would say that the, the standards around recertification vary a great deal. And it's important to really understand the process and to trust the process of the people that are doing the recertification. Um, you know, when, when you look at one of our devices, it's difficult to, 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 to really tell that it's not a brand new machine. Um, and that was something that Bob was really insistent on early on. And, you know, they are replacing the hard drive. We are replacing the battery. We're putting a lot into these machines outside of just taking them, wiping the hard drive and putting them back into the field. So, um, you know, there are companies that do a good job. We're certainly, I believe, one of them. Uh, but I would say when it comes to recertified devices, you want to be real careful who you're, uh, who you're purchasing from. So, and, you know, the other side of it is, uh, you know, the, the scalability. So the other thing that was important to Bob was the fact that Bloom is as large as we are. And, you know, we, we can, I think the, the very first time Bob said, Mike, how many, how many devices could you get if we need them? And I said, I think we have about 300,000 in stock now, Bob, how many do you need? And he yeah, said, I need 12. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, the, the supply and demand won't be a problem. As, as we need more, we'll continue to purchase more and more. And just, just to add on this, Tom, uh, to what Mike described, uh, it's not just a device. When you boot it up, it's got all the inclusive resources that Bob and the other panelists have shared, and I assume more to come over time. So I don't think you can get a, cert a recertified computer anyplace else with all that pre-booted. Amen. And we're really excited about this. And this is, you know, this is, so you all should, one takeaway is drive imaging ought to become one of the phrases you become fluent with. Drive imaging allows what Tom just shared. It allows you to put links on these devices. If you're going to put a new operating system on, like Windows 11, why not take advantage of that to point to inclusion resources at no extra cost? It's a, it's a, it's a really, it's kind of a no-brainer thing. Now we've got in the in the one question in the in the chat from Christy Bean is the webinar being recorded? Yes, and you will get a link to the recording. Absolutely. Uh, and and Maribel Martinez, hello. This is Alumni Weekend to see you uh, on this. Uh, yes. Bloom can provide refurbished laptops to needy people now. Absolutely. We're doing this with state agencies. This is at scale. We're looking to, we're looking to scale with other bank on coalitions around the country, like, like Bill's wonderful whole infrastructure there. Uh, and then, okay, so we've got, let's see, uh, just making sure maintenance and repair is an issue for state agencies. Yes. Uh, yes, we are. David uh, Rosen comments that, uh, he, he's glad that we're all planning to advocate to state digital equity planning leaders that they need to allow for, they need to provision in their plans for uh, maintenance and repair. Absolutely. We want this to be, we want this to be really impactful and, and good. Uh, Mike has just put his, uh, put his content in there. And I think we are, uh, I think a few folks have had to have, have had to jump because we, we've extended beyond our time. Really want to thank our panelists and and all of you. Uh, any final comments uh, for uh, to stir up more good trouble before we close? Bob Terry again here, real quick. Just wanted to say, with all the great questions and people staying on even over time, I know we struck a nerve. The webinar series is going great, and I just want to thank our all our panelists. You know, thank you for your insight and taking the time to share. You know all the possibilities that are that are available right now, and so now is the time to act. And thank you. Thank you, and Terry, deepest thanks for your making this whole this whole uh, conversation possible. You've been just amazing. Thank you all so much. We'll stop the recording there. <laughs>